Sorry, y'all. I'm not. I wasn't ready for that. I had a good question, and I lost track of time. My bad. My bad. Hi, everyone. I'm Luke. I'm the youth pastor. If you couldn't tell, uh, that was a very youth pastor thing to do. Um, yes, my name is Luke Hanna. I'm the youth guy here. I'm here with Danielle uh, Ben. She is our women's ministry director, so she's going to be telling us about some women's events coming up. But as you're all trickling in, if by some chance you are brand new to this church, I would like to send out a nice welcome. We have this cool little blue card on the seat back in front of you or in your worship folders. Worship folders. It's called a connection card. On one side, it has all of our services. So if this is your first time here, this is our contemporary service. If you like hymns and a more traditional feeling, our first two services are a more traditional service. Also, hello, everyone online. If you have any questions, want to respond to the message, a prayer request, a question about how our church runs. You feel free to put all of that on this little notepad on the back. You can drop this either in person to someone at the welcome desk or in one of the red receptacles. We will see them either way. We're glad you're here. Uh, Danielle's got a cool announcement for us for an upcoming event. So, Danielle. Good morning. I have a question for you guys. How many of you have ever lied to yourself or heard a little lie in your head? right? We tend to do that, right? Well, a few weeks ago, I was having one of those kind of weeks where I just kept hearing all those little lies in my head. You're not a good enough wife. You're not a good enough mom. You're not good enough at your job. You're not good enough. And it kept resounding in my brain over and over again. And I went home and I was discouraged and I said, you know what? I need to get into the word and I need to find the truth because God's word is truth. And so I started finding truth like you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are made in the image of God. And all of those truths started seeking into my soul and giving me encouragement. And you know what? I am enough because God is enough. Jesus is enough. So I texted my Auntie Jan, who happens to be our, our tea speaker for this year. She's amazing woman of God who has traveled all the world around the world speaking. But anyways, I texted her and I told her about all the awful things I was going through in my head and how I combated it with the truth of the word. And she was like, that's amazing. That needs to be our theme. And so our theme for women's tea is steeped in truth. Because you know what, ladies, we need to be steeping ourselves in the truth of the word on a daily basis. So hopefully this tea will encourage you to be steeped in truth. Uh, I hope you can make it. It is April 26th, right? <laughs> I just blanked all of a sudden. April 26, 7 p.m. in the gym. Please get signed up. You can either scan that little QR code on the announcement form or you can come back to the hub and somebody can help you sign up at the hub. So I hope you can make it. Sweet. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, so that is for the ladies to go and for tea. But if you're a guy and you don't want to miss out on the women's tea, there is a spot for you. So if you would like to serve our women... Our men's ministry director, Dana Sorum, this is an opportunity for the men of our church, any age, if you want to serve in our church, this is a chance that you can do that. Whether that's serving tea, not drinking it, serving it, and just being involved in that. So we'd love to see you there. You can also find a way to sign up for that. Talk to people at the Hub. They'll get you all connected or go to our website. So right before we start, though, we're going to enter into a time of worship. And there's different ways that we can worship God. We can worship God through prayer, through singing, 
through our occupation, lots of different ways. But another way that we get to worship God is through our giving, because we have been given so much. Giving financially isn't something that we have to do, but it's something that we get to do. And so viewing it as something that we have been given so much that we get to give in return to God is something that we are also called to do. So I encourage you guys, if you do have something to give today, if God has put that on your heart, any of the red receptacles in the back, or take it up to the front desk, they would be happy to take that for you as long as long with your connection card. So following that, we are going to worship God in song. So I'm going to pray for us real quick, and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that we get to come together to worship you, to fellowship together in this place. We thank you that you've provided a place for us to do that. I thank you for the opportunities that we get to demonstrate your love and your glory every day, whether it's at work, at sports, at school. We thank you for that. We ask that this time today would be blessed and that the message would mean, uh, have an impact on someone's heart today. In your name, amen. Let's stand and worship. Good morning. So glad you're here this morning. Just encourage you to put your thoughts on him. Just give him the praise he deserves. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no Like you, none like you. 
power like the power of Jesus. The faith will rise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power. Just for clarification, I looked at it and it said, you're praying. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, glad you're on thank you. Now. Good morning, so church. <laughs> Have a seat. Welcome. Glad that you're here this morning. Um, I'm going to grab this. Hey, if you have a Bible, if you would grab that and open it up to the book of Mark. Um, if you do not, you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the seat back in front of you. Turn it to page 887, and that's where Mark is. If you uh, have a journal, scripture journal, you can use that. And the fascinating thing is the technology of the world that we live in today, your phone has a Bible on it, the version app. So basically what I'm telling you today is you don't have an excuse. <laughs> Oh, well, let's do this. You know, as we, uh, as we walk through uh, the book of Mark, uh, last week we, um, we saw that Mark, what he was doing is he was, uh, he had this eye uh, to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's kind of where he's going. And um, and we find for the, for the most part, before Mark tells us what to do, he shows us what to do. He shows us who it is that we are to follow. And, uh, and he shows us who, uh, uh, who Jesus actually is. <laughs> makes me think of the story of, um, makes me think of the story of the little girl who is uh, drawing a picture in a class. She's like really intently drawing this picture. And the teacher comes up to her and asks, asks her, um, what are you drawing? And she says, I'm, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, the teacher says, no, no one knows what God look, looks like. <laughs> and she says, well, they will when I'm done. <laughs> You know, on one hand, I really appreciate her confidence. The problem and the truth uh, of the story is that we tend to draw our own picture of who he is. Uh, and it's true. No one knows what God looks like. But Jesus, what Jesus we, we, know what God, we, we know what Jesus looks like. I was a, former, I was a police chaplain at, uh, in the community that I lived in. And I uh, saw a lot of things, a lot, a lot, a lot of things. And <laughs> I remember walking into one, one home with, this, with these officers, and there was a picture of Jesus. And I thought, oh, that's what he looks like. Well, the eyes followed me the whole time I was there. <laughs> and, 
and he didn't look very happy with me. <laughs> we tend, here's my point. We tend to paint our own picture of Jesus. Not, not what he looks like, but who he is. And, and, and what we have determined is, is our view of Jesus, uh, the real view of Jesus, or is our view of Jesus the Jesus that, that is of our making? If your Jesus, if your Jesus always agrees with you, never confronts you, never contradicts you, then you probably have a Jesus of your own making. Friends, we don't decide who he is. We discover him. And that's what we're doing as we walk through Mark. Mark is showing us who the real Jesus is. And, and he begins by showing us that, that he is the long-expected Messiah that Isaiah talked about. If you read those first couple verses in, in Mark, he, he shows us that. And today he, uh, we see again that Mark will show us something very important about him. But before we get that, it's, it's, it's extremely fascinating. Before we get to that point, I want to go back to last week. Uh, and I want to look at a few of those verses again, and I want to make a few just simple observations uh, of what's going on. So, Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 4. Let me read this again. It says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I've baptized you with water, but you will baptize me, but, I, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now these verses, we see a couple truths. Now, scratch that. We see truths, but we also see some actions happen here. They're, these are actions that are modeled for us if we are going to be disciples of Jesus. Uh, my daughter Shelby works, uh, she works with kids in, the, in our kids' wing, and she loves, loves uh, working with kids. Her life purpose is to influence kids, to work with, with, with kids, to be a teacher. And uh, uh, each week we go out to lunch once a week and uh, I'm gonna miss that when she's off at college and all doing that. Well, that's a whole nother story. We don't need to go there, but um, each week we go grab lunch and I'm gonna be honest with you, sometimes I make her pay. <laughs> I do. Um, but we generally, we talk about life, like what's going on. We talk about the message sometimes. And this week, we got into the discussion of the message and what a disciple is. And I said to Shelby, I said, Shelby, what do you, how do you teach, she, she's with the littles, how do you teach kids what a disciple is? Uh, because we, I would say the definition of a disciple of Jesus is a follower of Jesus. She says, Dad, what we do, what I teach is that, that a disciple of Jesus is a helper of Jesus. And I said, interesting. I said, why do you say helper and not follower of Jesus? And she said, well, this is super smart. Again, little kids, she says, well, they don't understand follower. They understand helper. Like their mom and dad say, help clean up. There's songs that, you know, do the thing. A, a helper of Jesus. The, the other side of it is, um, she's also like, Dad, I want to teach them first uh, what a leader is before I teach them what a follower is so that they, they understand that. So as we look at this, um, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus, a helper of Jesus? Um, last week we saw that, that God meets people in the desert times of our lives. When we have hit, uh, some would say rock bottom, or we're walking through a, a really a valley, a tough time. And we could see in what we just read at least two things that followers of Jesus do. 
So I want to talk about that before we jump into a little bit deeper stuff today. Uh, What are these two things that followers of Jesus do? The first thing is that followers of Jesus prepare the way for others. If you look at verse 7, it says, and he preached, it's talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Friends, uh, he sent John to prepare the way for the people in the desert to meet Jesus. Uh, John was not there for John. Okay, he was, John was not there for John. He was not focusing on himself. He was there to point people to Jesus. It, like this road sign points you towards your destination. So our lives are to point people to Jesus. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you say, yes, I've made him the leader of my life. Then we are to point others towards Jesus. If I were to ask you, who is the man or the woman in your life that has pointed you to Jesus? Uh, For me, uh, one is pretty obvious, if you've heard any of my story, that is my dad. My dad pointed me to Jesus. Now here's what's interesting about my dad. My dad pointed me to Jesus. He did the same thing to others, uh, some of my other siblings. I chose to follow Jesus. Some of my other siblings chose to follow Jesus after dad pointed us to Jesus. One of my siblings hasn't. That's crushing, not only as a brother, but as a father. I think of a man named Harold Hitt. Even after I came to faith in Jesus, I was walking with Jesus. He continued to point me to Jesus on how to be a good dad, how to be a good father, how to be a good uh, 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 a good leader. I think of Pastor Keith Evans. He, he pointed me to Jesus. Dr. Jeff Ward, he pointed me to Jesus as I, as I learned to be a leader, as I learned to, uh, to be a shepherd and a pastor. There are people in my life that have pointed me to Jesus. If I were to ask you afterwards, if you have a relationship with Jesus, who is it that, is, that, that, that God has used in your life to point you to him? Friends, God will use you to be that somebody for someone else. If you know Jesus personally, just as he used the Heralds and the Keiths and the Jeffs, he will use someone, he will use you to be that for someone else. So as we look at this, that's what followers of Jesus do. We say by our lives and our words, follow me as I follow Jesus. The other thing uh, what followers of Jesus do is followers of Jesus choose to be baptized. This is what it says in verse 4. It says he came baptizing in the desert. Now, interesting that he, he came baptizing. Remember, this is, this is thousands of years ago, as we saw last week. This was a new thing. Before this time in history, people might have been baptized, but it was them cleansing themselves, them cleaning themselves. But John came, he came showing that we can't clean ourselves. We can't cleanse ourselves. We need God to do that. That's why someone else baptizes us. So crowds of people, they they followed John and they were baptized. And the baptism meant that they were identifying themselves with the Savior, with Jesus. If you come to know Jesus, you say yes to him, and you haven't been baptized, I encourage you, it's an important step for you to take. Listen, not to make you a Christian but to show the world that you are one, that you've made a decision to follow him. The first step is to surrender our lives to Jesus, to say yes to him. You're the leader of my life. The second step is to be baptized, to show the world that you belong to Jesus, that you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit and we want to stand and say, I am no longer on my own. I am a follower of Jesus. And so I encourage you, if you are a follower of Jesus and haven't been baptized, I encourage you to do that. You never know. We're gonna have a baptism after, the, uh, after this service. You never know what God will do in you 
Not to mention through you, by being baptized, you might prepare the way for someone else. Here's an interesting story. I just heard it about 10 minutes ago. The, the, the young lady that's going to be baptized today, uh, she met with one of our ladies. And after they met, the lady that she met with, her daughter came to her and said, Hey, I want to talk to you about baptism. That's because this, this young lady that's going to be baptized later, Allie, said yes to Jesus and is following through. She's scared to death. But she's still doing it. I, I love the picture that baptism brings. Now, some of us are emotion. We show it. Some of us don't. It's okay. You don't have to do this. But I, I think of this picture. <laughs> After, yeah, that was Easter. This girl was baptized. Man, she came out of the water with her arms up. I remember as a youth guy, man, they would hug me or give me a high five. Some of them would try to take me down with them. I mean, it was like they were just so excited about it. And what was taking place? These, friends, are two actions that are, mo that are modeled for us. Where, where followers of Jesus point others to Jesus and followers of Jesus choose to be baptized. Now, we're going to read here in a moment that Jesus himself comes to be baptized. And if you're new to church, you're going, wait, what? Why? And that's a great question. Jesus wasn't a sinner. He never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 never, ever sinned. Okay. One reason was to identify himself as the Messiah, to model for us the important step. And something else that I want to talk about today, it's to show us who he is. So the question is, who is the real Jesus? The real Jesus is God. Look at what this says, verse 9. You can take that picture off. There we go. It says, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. So, picture what's taking place here. John is baptizing all these people, and then here comes Jesus strolling down the, the, the side of the river. He walks to the river. I, I would think that people are going, wait, is that him? Is that, is that him? What's he doing? He goes into the water. John immediately knows him, and he says, there he is. And it says that he baptizes Jesus. And when Jesus is baptized, some uh, pretty amazing things happen. Now, we don't know if other people there, if they saw this or, uh, and they heard this, uh, because it says he saw, okay, Jesus saw and heard them. But some amazing things happen. And what we see is that the Lord led Mark to pull back the veil a little and give us a glimpse to see the work of God in a much deeper, much more amazing way. The first thing that, that we see is that when he came up out of the water, it says that the heavens were torn open. We don't know exactly what that means. Okay, well, we don't know exactly what that looked like. The word means, the word that they use, it means torn, ripped, open. It, when I think about this, I think, well, could there, could there be other words that they could have used that simply meant just to open? No, they use this word, torn open. And I think about it, things that are opened Things that are open can be closed, right? But when it is torn open, it can't just be shut. As if to say that God is opening up the way to heaven in a way that no man can close. What God opens, no man can shut. What God closes, no man can open. This same word, interesting, this same word 
that was used here, torn, is the same word that was used at Jesus' death when the veil of the temple was torn in two, the wall that surrounded the holies of holies, which re represented the presence of God uh, in, in which only a priest could go in once, once a year. That veil was torn from top to bottom to show that God had, had, had come to man and opened up, had, had torn the two walls that separated us from him. Now, it, 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 it was now possible, when this takes place, it was now possible to know him personally without going through a priest. That's what scripture says. We see God at work tearing away, uh, uh, tearing away the, 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 the heaven, opening it up. Just like back when he died, now it's happening at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And it's the climax. And then Mark says, the, the heavens opened up, torn open. Then Mark says, and the spirit descended on him like a dove. Now, Many have pictured this as a dove coming and landing on Jesus' shoulder. And, I mean, it could have, but we don't, I mean, we don't know that. We don't know uh, what it's saying. The, the spirit looked like a dove or the spirit descended like a dove descends. It, it's also very interesting that, that most, of, uh, most of the people in that time, they spoke Aramaic. And, and the scribes had translated the Hebrew scriptures into Aramaic. It, it, it's, called the, it's called the Targum. And in the creation account in Genesis, the first part of Genesis, it says that God created the heavens and the earth and the spirit hovered over the waters like a dove. So it's pretty significant here that Mark says the spirit descended like a dove. We see the same picture of the Spirit at creation. And now, at new creation. Then the Father said, or then, and then Mark says this, that the Father speaks and he says, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Uh, this is pretty powerful not only is it powerful, I'm going to kind of go touchy-feely on you, it's beautiful. Like nothing a son or a daughter wants to hear more than the love of a good and loving father is the dad to say, hey, I love you. Now, I, I don't remember, honestly, I don't remember a lot of times when I was younger when my dad said I love you. It doesn't mean he didn't. I just as a younger person, I, I didn't hear it a lot. But as I got older, I began to remember. When my dad would say, hey son, love you, have a great day, have a great week. I remembered those. It, it, it meant a lot. Now, I don't know what feeling you get when you hear the word father? For some of you, it's painful. If we're being honest, it's painful. It's confusing maybe. For some of you, it is really hard to see God as a loving father if you've not seen that from your earthly father. Let, let me say this. No matter who your earthly father is or was, there is a heavenly father who loves you. And it is significant that the father told Jesus uh, at this point in time in his ministry, at the beginning, not at the end, he didn't wait and see how things were play, gonna play out. At the beginning, he says, son, I love you. And I'm proud of you. Let me say something. He says the same thing to you. Today, right now. He says, hey, I love you. Now, there's something interesting here. We see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God all present at Jesus' baptism. 
Well, we call it the Trinity. Now, the, the word Trinity is not found in the New Testament. But we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit present to us. Uh, the, Trinity, the word Trinity, it simply means triunity or, 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 or triune. Um, and again, Mark is pulling back the veil for us to see, in case you wondered, Jesus really is God. He really is part uh, of a triune God. And this passage, it shows us that our God is one God in three persons. Now, this is the moment in the message where some of you are going to grab the worship folder, the bulletin, and you're going to read it. There's a few of you that are going to stay with me. Stay with me, okay? Uh, let's process and let's, let's walk through this. Um. He is not three gods that work in harmony. That, that, that's called uh, uh, tritheism. That's what that's called. Uh, he is not one God that takes uh, one form sometime and another form another time. Like today I'm going to wear God the Father hat and tomorrow I'm going to wear uh, God the Son hat. Uh, that's called unipersonalism. Not universalism, that's when you just believe whatever. Unipersonalism. This is where you believe one God who is one person who just changes roles. He is Trinity. He is one God in three persons who, who know and love one another. God is not more fundamentally one than he is three, and he's not more fundamentally three than he is one. Did your brain just explode? This is very difficult. In fact, uh, it's beyond what we can fully understand. And I'm going to say something. I'm okay with that. Now, this is not the only place in the Bible where, uh, where you see this picture of God at work at three persons. We go again back to the creation we see God the Father who's the voice, Jesus who is later described as the Word and the Spirit, again, hovering like a dove over the waters. It is as if Mark is deliberately reminding us that this God who is three in one was present at the beginning of creation and he is present at the redemption of the world, at, at, at this new beginning. Now, I, there's some of you are deep, you're deep involved in the worship folder right now. Some of you love this. <laughs> some of you, you love these difficult ideas about God. And others of you are probably like, well, and this is, I'm a little bit in between. Some of you are going, okay, what does this got to do with real life? Like, pastor, really, what's this got to do with real life? Stay with me. It's amazing how significant this is, this idea that our God is one God who is, in three, who is three persons who know each other and have constantly loved each other for all eternity. Again, I want to take you back to creation. We, we, we use the, uh, there's a term that's going to be used that we're going to see this. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says this. It says that, then God said... Let us make man. Do you see that? Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let us. Who's us? The Trinity. Again, what does this, what does this have to do with real life? Listen, some of the best minds for centuries have thought, uh, they have thought hard and deep about this. And they give us some, some pretty amazing insights. First, this idea of Trinity shows us that man didn't just make up Christianity. Okay? It wasn't just made up by some people who were trying to get, uh, to, trying to get a following. If it was, they wouldn't have made up the Trinity, okay? For one thing, who would have ever thought of it? The second, why would you include something so complex and so hard to understand? 
Friends, our God has shown us who he is and he is so much greater than we can comprehend. But think about this. Think about what the Trinity, what, what the Trinity, the triune God teaches us about love and teaches us about life. Let, let me, what if, what if he were three gods, polytheistic, three gods, uh, three different gods with three different limited roles, well, which one should we worship? And when should we worship them? Which one should we follow? But if he is three in one, the power is limitless. And we follow him, not them. Well, what if God was, was just one person that just changed roles from time to time? That, that, that means that, that love would not have existed until creation. Because real love has to have a giver and it has to have a receiver. So, so love wouldn't have existed until God created man. It, wouldn't have, it, it would have meant that, that, that on his own, God might have been about power, but, 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 not, but not love. It would have meant that following God was simply a one-to-one -one thing. And it could have shown the reason that he created mankind was because he was lonely. In other words, that, that he created to get. But if he is a triune God, if he is a triune God, three persons knowing and loving each other for all eternity, that means that love existed before the beginning of time. And it means that he did not create mankind to get love, but to give it. And it shows us that knowing God is not just a, a me and he thing, but it involves community. Friends, one of the truths that, that, that I'm learning about following Jesus is, is, that, uh, is that it involves community. It, it's not just a, a, a me and a he thing. It's not just my personal relationship with him. It is we. It's one another. It, it is me and he, but it is also we and he. It's community. What Mark shows us is that Jesus is part of a community. Be, before, before Jesus was, was a part of community with his disciples, with his closest followers, he was part of commu the community of God. And, and this is not a small truth. And I'm learning that part of following Jesus means being in community. And I'm learning that, that, that we talk about it better than we live it. I'm going to kind of show myself here a little bit, be a little vulnerable. This is true for me. This is very challenging for me because there are times that I just want to be alone. And it, it, it can make me a little nervous to let you, let you in too deep. Now, I know this fear is not just my own. Some of you share the same fear. But I'm also learning that we miss out on so much when we are, we are not connected with a few other people in community where we are walking with God, where we are following God together. And if we are going to become a culture of disciples who make disciples, a culture of people who are following Jesus, we must learn to do it together. That, that, that we have a group of people who are doing life with and following Jesus with, and we are heading in the same direction together. Uh, I think of the story of the two guys who they were up for promotion in their work, not for the same position, different positions. And one got the promotion, the other one didn't. It would have been really easy for the one that didn't get the promotion to be pretty mad, kind of go into a corner and 
have a poor me session, but he didn't. He celebrated his friend. He threw a party for the one that was promoted. What, what, if, what if we all desired that? Here's the thing. We're oftentimes too busy and too scared to try it. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm kind of letting... <laughs> the, the other thing is, is it's hard. And here's why. Because people are irritating. P- people are irritating. It's easier to just not deal with irritation. But... That's oftentimes exactly what we need. I think of Hebrews 10, it says, let us consider how we may spur one one another along in love and in good deeds. Spur, you know what that word means? (laughs) Irritate. God often uses that irritation as sandpaper to shape us into the image of his son. We have, I'm going to tell you, we have become a very individualized nation. We value our individuality, and we've lost what it means to be in community. And I'm not judging because I struggle with it too. The thing is this. The thing is, this is not a new thought. Churches have been trying to figure it out for a really t- long time, and we have not done well at making disciples. Who, who, uh, who, we have not done well at discovering community with each other. We've not done well at putting those together where we, were, where we are making disciples and discovering community. And I think it's because there, 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 there's this ingredient that's missing And you know what the ingredient is? Mission. Mission. It's been said this way. These are not my words. When you are on mission together, we have direction and we find community along the way. When we seek community first, we find neither mission nor community. My friend communicates this to his organization over and over and over and over again, and we need to do it here. The mission matters most. The mission matters most. And maybe a better definition of community is this. A group, family of people on mission together, knowing, loving, serving, and celebrating along the way a greater purpose, a greater mission. Friends, community is something that we become, that develops along the way as we follow Jesus together. Um, We had Easter a few weeks ago. Uh, The cross, we we talked about this a little bit, the cross, when, when the sin of the world was placed on Jesus, that separated him from the community, from, from the community of God that was broken for the first time in history. He was alone for the only time in eternity. And J- Jesus gave up what was his, what, what, what he deserves so that you and I can reser- re- uh, uh, so that you and I can get what we don't deserve. And that is a relationship. That is community with God. And in an amazing way, friends, when that happens, we join each other on mission together. What would it be like if we were a church If we were a church, a group, a family of people on mission together, knowing, loving, serving, and celebrating along the way to a greater mission, to a greater purpose. Do you struggle to have community? Maybe you need to be on mission together. Uh, One of the things that you can do 
let's take this connection card. I'm kind of opening the can before it's ready to be opened, but I'll deal with the mics when I need to on Tuesday. Uh, we, are, uh, we are strengthening um, our life group model where we are not only strengthening on campus, but we're gonna begin to develop off-campus life groups. And if you are, are, if you're like going, okay, I'm the dude that likes to be alone, but I know I need to be in community with other believers, what I wanna challenge you to do is uh, I want you to write life group on your connection card. You need to put your name. We don't have a fingerprint reader yet. Um, (laughs) You need to put your name on there so we know. And over the next few weeks, next month or so, We'll begin to reach out to you and give you some options of life groups on campus or off campus that you can be a part of. We want you to be a part of those things. The other thing that I want to draw your attention to is that um, if you are here and you're going, oh, wow, a follower of Jesus points others to Jesus and a follower of Jesus models baptism, and you have, you, you're saying, I know Jesus, I have a relationship with Jesus, but I haven't taken a step of baptism. I want you to mark your card, baptism, and, and I guarantee you, somebody will contact you before Wednesday. And they'll talk to you about that. Others of you, if you're here this morning and you have never said yes to Jesus, you've never given your life to him, you still have a lot of questions, It's okay to ask questions. Questions are good. But we want to encourage you that after the service, even during the singing, Actually, I don't want you to sneak out during the singing. Uh, we're going to have a baptism. And if you're have, you have questions about having a relationship with Jesus, watch the baptism. And then after the baptism, I want you to go to the Smith Rock Room. And we're going to have a group of people in there that are there to talk to you about Jesus, to help answer your questions about the church and uh, who we are as a church, to answer questions about baptism, to pray with you. They're going to be in, that, in the Smith Rock Room afterwards. Um, those are ways that you can respond. You will hear me say over and over and over, what is the Lord saying to you and what are you gonna do about it? Each person in this room has a way that they can respond, whether it be in a community or steps to follow Jesus. Today we're, gonna, we're going to celebrate the baptism of a young lady named Allie. Allie's with her daughter Rose down here in the front row, going to watch. It's pretty cool. And here, here's one of the things. I was telling Allie back there, hey, I appreciate you because I know that you were listening at church. I think there's about 10 of you that do. And the reason why I knew she was listening is I, we went to, I was at lunch one morning or one afternoon meeting with a pastor. I think we were at Madeline's. And we were eating, uh, we were eating lunch. And it was over, and we got up to leave, and Allie and uh, her daughter Rose were sitting there eating, and she goes, hey, pastor, you said at church if we see you in public to say hi to you. And I was like, you listen. (laughs) You are one of the 10 that listen. Thank you. But it was really encouraging to me that she was like, hey, I'm just saying hi. Well, here we are uh, a few weeks later, and she is going to take the step of obedience, an inward decision that she's already made. She is publicly professing that through baptism. And we ask her four questions. If you, if you are going to be baptized, we're going to ask you these same four questions. We asked, Allie, what was your life like before you received Jesus? It was very simple. She said, I was confused and I have the, had this continual feeling of lostness. And we asked her, well, how did you become aware of your need for Jesus? How did, how did God get your attention? She said, after I hit rock bottom, that desert, I don't know what it is, but after I hit rock bottom, God really revealed himself to me. And he revealed, listen to this, he revealed that belief was not enough, that a relationship was what I needed. We asked her, well, when did you come, when did you commit your your life to Jesus? And here's what she said. She gave a date, which is awesome. July 6th. I got my Bible out, I began to dive into it, begin to read it daily, and since then, God has continued to be working. Well, Danielle, who is our women's ministry director, she's the one that got to walk through this with her. She asked her the last question, what difference has Jesus made in your life? And her response was this, everything, everything. I have a whole new perspective on life, and I have a whole new purpose. I have a new mission. 
Let's pray. God, thank you for Allie and the decision that she made to follow you and now following through with baptism. Lord, I pray for anybody in this room that has questions about what it means to have a relationship with you, that you would speak to their heart, that you would help them to have the courage to ask some questions, that after the baptism, they would go to the Smith Rock Room and they would ask for prayer, that they would ask uh, to help answer some of these questions about what it means to have a relationship with you. Lord, I thank you for the example that Allie is setting by publicly professing an inward decision that she already made. Lord, would you work in her heart? Would you help her to continue to grow in you? And Lord, would you speak to us today? Help us to respond to how you want us to respond, Father. We give this to you and we thank you for all that you've done and will do. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. What a great song. Uh, Allie and I had a spider in here that wanted to be baptized too, but we took care of that. <laughs> Sorry where you're going, buddy. Um, <laughs> This is so great to end services like this. You know, we've had like, we've had several weeks now of people being baptized. Let's keep it going, okay? Um, this is Allie. Allie's here with, like I mentioned, her daughter Rose right there and her grandparents. And uh, it's super awesome to celebrate this. You're nervous, but that's okay. Allie, do you know that Jesus lives in your heart? Yes. Yes. Well, it is my privilege based on your profession of faith to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. Risen to walk with him in new life. Amen. Church, how are you going to respond? What are you, what's the Lord saying to you? And what are you going to do about it? Have a great week, and we'll see you back next Sunday.